Letter 102 on the intimations of our immortality. Just as a man is annoying when he rouses a dreamer of pleasant dreams, for he is spoiling a pleasure which may be unreal but nevertheless has the appearance of reality, even so your letter has done me an injury. For it brought me back abruptly, absorbed as I was in agreeable meditation, and ready to proceed still further if it had been permitted me. I was taking pleasure in investigating the immortality of souls, nay, in believing that doctrine. For I was lending a ready ear to the opinions of the great authors, who not only approve but promise this most pleasing condition. I was giving myself over to such a noble hope, for I was already weary of myself, beginning already to despise the fragments of my shattered existence and feeling that I was destined to pass over into the infinity of time and the heritage of eternity, when I was suddenly awaked by the receipt of your letter, and lost my lovely dream. But if I can once dispose of you, I shall reseek and rescue it. There was a remark at the beginning of your letter that I had not explained the whole problem wherein I was endeavoring to prove one of the beliefs of our school, that the renown which falls to one's lot after death is a good. For I had not solved the problem with which we are usually confronted. No good can consist of things that are distinct and separate, yet renown consists of such things. What you are asking about, my dear Lucilius, belongs to another topic of the same subject, and that is why I had postponed the arguments, not only on this one topic, but on other topics which also covered the same ground. For, as you know, certain logical questions are mingled with ethical ones. Accordingly, I handled the essential part of my subject, which has to do with conduct as to whether it is foolish and useless to be concerned with what lies beyond our last day, or whether our goods die with us and there is nothing left of him who is no more, or whether any profit can be attained or attempted beforehand out of that which, when it comes, we shall not be capable of feeling. All these things have a view to conduct, and therefore they have been inserted under the proper topic. But the remarks of dialecticians in opposition to this idea had to be sifted out, and were accordingly laid aside. Now that you demand an answer to them all, I shall examine all their statements, and then refute them singly. Unless, however, I make a preliminary remark, it will be impossible to understand my rebuttals. And what is that preliminary remark? Simply this. There are certain continuous bodies, such as a man. There are certain composite bodies, as ships, houses, and everything which is the result of joining separate parts into one sum total. There are certain others made up of things that are distinct, each member remaining separate like an army, a populace, or a senate. For the persons who go to make up such bodies are united by virtue of law or function, but by their nature they are distinct and individual. Well, what further prefatory remarks do I still wish to make? Simply this. We believe that nothing is a good if it be composed of things that are distinct. For a single good should be checked and controlled by a single soul, and the essential quality of each single good should be single. This can be proved of itself whenever you desire. In the meanwhile, however, it had to be laid aside, because our own weapons are being hurled at us. Opponents speak thus. You say, do you, that no good can be made up of things that are distinct? Yet this renown of which you speak is simply the favorable opinion of good men. For just as reputation does not consist of one person's remarks, and as ill repute does not consist of one person's disapproval, so renown does not mean that we have merely pleased one good person. In order to constitute renown, the agreement of many distinguished and praiseworthy men is necessary. But this results from the decision of a number, in other words, of persons who are distinct. Therefore, it is not a good. You say again that renown is the praise rendered to a good man by good men. Praise means speech. Now speech is utterance with a particular meaning. And utterance, even from the lips of good men, is not a good in itself. For any act of a good man is not necessarily a good. He shouts his applause and hisses his disapproval but one does not call the shouting or the hissing good, although his entire conduct may be admired and praised, any more than one would applaud a sneeze or a cough. Therefore, renown is not a good. Finally, tell us whether the good belongs to him who praises or to him who is praised. If you say that the good belongs to him who is praised, you are on as foolish a quest as if you were to maintain that my neighbor's good health is my own. But to praise worthy men is an honorable action. Thus the good is exclusively that of the man who does the praising, of the man who performs the action, and not of us, who are being praised. And yet this was the question under discussion. I shall now answer the separate objections hurriedly. The first question still is whether any good can consist of things that are distinct, and there are votes cast on both sides. 
Again, does renown need many votes? Renown can be satisfied with the decision of one good man. It is one good man who decides that we are good. Then the retort is, what, would you define reputation as the esteem of one individual and ill repute as the rancorous chatter of one man? Glory too we take to be more widespread, for it demands the agreement of many men. But the position of the many is different from that of the one. And why? Because if the good man thinks well of me, it practically amounts to my being thought well of by all good men, for they will all think the same if they know me. Their judgment is alike and identical. The effect of truth on it is equal. They cannot disagree, which means that they would all hold the same view, being unable to hold different views. One man's opinion, you say, is not enough to create glory or reputation. In the former case, one judgment is a universal judgment, because all, if they were asked, would hold one opinion. In the other case, however, men of dissimilar character give divergent judgments. You will find perplexing emotions, everything doubtful, inconstant, untrustworthy. And can you suppose that all men are able to hold one opinion? Even an individual does not hold to a single opinion. With a good man, it is truth that causes belief, and truth has but one function and one likeness. While among the second class of which I spoke, the ideas with which they agree are unsound. Moreover, those who are false are never steadfast. They are irregular and discordant. But praise, says the objector, is nothing but an utterance, and an utterance is not a good. When they say that renown is praise bestowed on the good by the good, what they refer to is not an utterance but a judgment. For a good man may remain silent, but if he decides that a certain person is worthy of praise, that person is the object of praise. Besides, praise is one thing, and the giving of praise another. The latter demands utterance also. Hence, no one speaks of a funeral praise, but says, praise giving, for its function depends upon speech. And when we say that a man is worthy of praise, we assure human kindness to him, not in words, but in judgment. So the good opinion, even of one who in silence feels inward approval of a good man, is praise. Again, as I have said, praise is a matter of the mind rather than of the speech. For speech brings out the praise that the mind has conceived, and publishes it forth to the attention of the many. To judge a man worthy of praise is to praise him. And when our tragic poet sings to us that it is wonderful to be praised by a well-praised hero, he means by one who is worthy of praise. Again, when an equally venerable bard says, Praise nurtureth the arts, he does not mean the giving of praise, for that spoils the arts. Nothing has corrupted oratory and all other studies that depend on hearing, so much as popular approval. Reputation necessarily demands words, but renown can be content with men's judgments, and suffice without the spoken word. It is satisfied not only amid silent approval, but even in the face of open protest. There is, in my opinion, this difference between renown and glory. The latter depends upon the judgments of the many, but renown on the judgments of good men. The retort comes, But whose good is this renown, this praise rendered to a good man by good men? Is it of the one praised, or of the one who praises? Of both, I say. It is my own good, in that I am praised, because I am naturally born to love all men, and I rejoice in having done good deeds and congratulate myself on having found men who express their ideas of my virtues with gratitude. That they are grateful is a good to the many, but it is a good to me also. For my spirit is so ordered that I can regard the good of other men as my own, in any case those of whose good I am myself the cause. This good is also the good of those who render the praise, for it is applied by means of virtue, and every act of virtue is a good. My friends could not have found this blessing if I had not been a man of the right stamp. It is therefore a good belonging to both sides, this being praised when one deserves it, just as truly as a good decision is the good of him who makes the decision, and also of him in whose favor the decision was given. Do you doubt that justice is a blessing to its possessor, as well as to the man to whom the just due was paid? To praise the deserving is justice, therefore the good belongs to both sides. This will be a sufficient answer to such dealers in subtleties. But it should not be our purpose to discuss things cleverly and to drag philosophy down from Her Majesty to such petty quibbles. How much better it is to follow the open and direct road, rather than to map out for yourself a circuitous route, which you must retrace with infinite trouble. For such argumentation is nothing else than the sport of men who are skillfully juggling with each other. Tell me rather how closely in accord with nature it is to let one's mind reach out into the boundless universe. 
The human soul is a great and noble thing. It permits of no limits except those which can be shared even by the gods. First of all, it does not consent to a lowly birthplace, like Ephesus or Alexandria, or any land that is even more thickly populated than these, and more richly spread with dwellings. The soul's homeland is the whole space that encircles the height and breadth of the firmament, the whole rounded dome within which lie land and sea, within which the upper air that sunders the human from the divine also unites them, and where all the sentinel stars are taking their turn on duty. Again, the soul will not put up with a narrow span of existence. All the years, says the soul, are mine. No epoch is closed to great minds. All time is open for the progress of thought. When the day comes to separate the heavenly from its earthly blend, I shall leave the body here where I found it, and shall of my own volition betake myself to the gods. I am not apart from them now, but am merely detained in a heavy and earthly prison. These delays of mortal existence are a prelude to the longer and better life. As the mother's womb holds us for ten months, making us ready, not for the womb itself, but for the existence into which we seem to be sent forth when at last we are fitted to draw breath and live in the open, just so, throughout the years extending between infancy and old age, we are making ourselves ready for another birth. A different beginning, a different condition await us. We cannot yet, except at rare intervals, endure the light of heaven. Therefore, look forward without fearing to that appointed hour, the last hour of the body, but not of the soul. Survey everything that lies about you, as if it were luggage in a guest chamber. You must travel on. Nature strips you as bare at your departure as at your entrance. You may take away no more than you brought in. What is more, you must throw away the major portion of that which you brought with you into life. You will be stripped of the very skin which covers you, that which has been your last protection. You will be stripped of the flesh, and lose the blood which is suffused and circulated through your body. You will be stripped of bones and sinews, the framework of these transitory and feeble parts. That day, which you fear as being the end of all things, is the birthday of your eternity. Lay aside your burden, why delay? Just as if you had not previously left the body which was your hiding place. You cling to your burden, you struggle. At your birth also greater effort was necessary on your mother's part to set you free. You weep and wail, and yet this very weeping happens at birth also. But then it was to be excused, for you came into the world wholly ignorant and inexperienced. When you left the warm and cherishing protection of your mother's womb, a freer air breathed into your face. Then you winced at the touch of a rough hand, and you looked in amaze at unfamiliar objects, still delicate and ignorant of all things. But now it is no new thing for you to be sundered from that of which you have previously been a part. Let go your already useless limbs with resignation and dispense with that body in which you have dwelt for so long. It will be torn asunder, buried out of sight, and wasted away. Why be downcast? This is what ordinarily happens. When we are born, the afterbirth always perishes. Why love such a thing as if it were your own possession? It was merely your covering. The day will come which will tear you forth and lead you away from the company of the foul and noisome womb. Withdraw from it now too as much as you can, and withdraw from pleasure, except such as may be bound up with essential and important things. Estrange yourself from it even now, and ponder on something nobler and loftier. Some day the secrets of nature shall be disclosed to you. The haze will be shaken from your eyes, and the bright light will stream in upon you from all sides. Picture to yourself how great is the glow when all the stars mingle their fires. No shadows will disturb the clear sky. The whole expanse of heaven will shine evenly, for day and night are interchanged only in the lowest atmosphere. Then you will say that you have lived in darkness, after you have seen, in your perfect state, the perfect light. That light which now you behold darkly with vision that is cramped to the last degree. And yet, far off as it is, you already look upon it and wonder, what do you think the heavenly light will be when you have seen it in its proper sphere? Such thoughts permit nothing mean to settle in the soul, nothing low, nothing cruel. They maintain that the gods are witnesses of everything. They order us to meet the gods' approval, to prepare ourselves to join them at some future time, and to plan for immortality. He that has grasped this idea shrinks from no attacking army, is not terrified by the trumpet blast, and is intimidated by no threats. How should it not be that a man feels no fear, if he looks forward to death? He also, who believes that the soul abides only as long as it is fettered in the body, scatters it abroad forthwith when dissolved, so that it may be useful even after death. For though he is taken from men's sight, still often our thoughts run back to the hero, 
and often the glory won by his race recurs to the mind. Consider how much we are helped by good example. You will thus understand that the presence of a noble man is of no less service than his memory. Farewell.